Cogshaw Farm Museum is a living historical farm set on 48 beautiful acres in Bristol, Rhode Island. This farm is being worked in much the same way as it was back in 1790. Depending on the season, you can see anything from weaving to blacksmithing, from sheep shearing to working with oxen. You might even see something as simple as making soap or preparing meals. Everything around the farm is done exactly as the early settlers did it, transporting you back in time. So whether you'd like to get back to nature and take a quiet walk, attend a workshop, or see demonstrations of 18th century skills, crafts, and farm work, Cogshaw Farm Museum is one place you'll want to visit again and again. We're a, a working 1790s farm. We're looking at the, the last decade of the 18th century, from 1790 to 1800. And we're looking very specifically at farming in Bristol, in this particular area, this particular farm. Uh, it was a tenant farm in the period, and so it wasn't occupied by the owners. It was occupied by folks who rented it. And we're trying to create an immersion experience to that uh, time period. And so as you walk around and as you look through our exhibits, um, you'll be seeing us working on that exhibit and, and getting it to that point and hopefully capturing your imagination. It's, it's a world that's so different than what we're living in that it's kind of interesting to bring to people the idea of how you did what you do, how you went about your daily life. Rather than getting into a textbook and really trying to di digest all this yourself, you can walk into this environment um, and really imagine uh, sort of the platform that these people were uh, working from as they were living in this time period, making their decisions. And uh, we're a museum of process, a museum of activity and work. We're not a museum of stuff um, or collection. Our, our real collection, but really the heart of what we do here is activity and it's all, it's all motion, really. So it's not, it's not about a collection of blankets, but rather how those blankets are made. It's not about um, a collection of gardening tools, but how those tools are used and how the people who use them interact with them. Back in 1790, all nails used for building were hand-forged nails. People had been using these types of nails for thousands of years, and in this time period, they were still forged the same way. The stock used to make the nails depended on what size nails were being made. In this demonstration, board nails are being made, so a quarter-inch stock is being used. But primarily, you're using board nails for if you're building a door or building a fence or putting shingles on a house, um, putting hinges on, um, pretty much all this, this size nail. To forge the nails, charcoal was used to fuel the fire because it was able to reach a temperature much beyond the melting point of iron. Eventually, when the fire settles in a little bit, you've got a nice little hot spot to, to heat your nail. And all you need to heat is probably a half inch of metal to make a nail. So you uh, try to get your fire control in such a way that you have enough material on it so it doesn't blow around, um, but it's a small enough fire that you're not wasting material. So you can achieve that by cooling the outer edges of the fire. Lost, just cattail and frame. Once the iron reaches the correct temperature, it is removed from the fire. start by just uh, forging out a shank. You make a shoulder the first couple of blows that defines where the nail is going to get caught in the header and the lump of metal that will eventually become the head. And you just forge out a rectangular shank. They're hardly ever square. They're a little bit more useful that way. And then you cut it uh, most of the way through, but not all the way through. And then grab the nail header, which um, makes the nail head. That lump gets stuck there, you see. And then you can smash it into a rose head. 
so there are four little facets. I'll pull this off. That form the head. Today, nails are just another commodity. But in 1790, they were all made by hand. And some people got very good at it. In England, most of these nails are made by a nail maker and a nailsmith. And he's making nails exclusively all day long. He's not making a whole lot of things in some nails. He's making probably a thousand to two thousand nails in a day. Um, obviously, I can't make that many. Uh, I'm not doing it as much as these guys used to be. But I aspire to it. All of the buildings on the farm were covered with shingles. The shingles were not a commodity that could be purchased at the local hardware store, like today. They were made by hand. When making shingles, you start almost anything out of wood. You start with a round piece of wood. You fell the tree, then you cut whatever lengths you need out of it, and then you split it up. Um, splitting is a really quick way to, to reduce the dimension of a piece of wood. And so instead of starting right off with circular saws and breaking things apart, you'll go ahead and split it, um, usually starting with wedges. And so you can actually split a tree from end to end with wedges um, and probably a large mallet. Um, so I have a section here that's, um, that's quarter split uh, with wedges and then I'll split it until I get billets, you know, sort of thin enough that I can use a fro. Uh, fro is a tool that um, has a blade to a right angle, at a right angle to the handle, so it's used for prying uh, more than it is for being driven into something. So I'll drive it in to start it into something. This billet is a little bit too big, so I'm going to get it to the final size that I need for a shingle. And these shingles want to be about three-eighths on the base so that they they wear well. And I'll just get the, and this is a blank for a shingle at this point. You know, you want it thick on one end where it's going to get the wear, and then tapered on the other end where it's going to slide up under the other shingles. Using a draw knife, you're using both hands. And so when you draw this thing to yourself, you have nothing left to hold um, the, the, the object that you're working on in place. So you use, um, this is a clamp design for this purpose. Um, that uses your feet to clamp the piece in place. It's called a shaving horse or a shaving mare. So I'll use my feet to clamp this thing uh, and shape a shingle. I'm going to start on the thick end, so I just want to smooth it off and start the taper just slightly. And then you use, use your eye just to find the high spots. Get it fairly straight, it doesn't have to be perfect. So now you basically have the taper on the shingle and um, I need to joint it. The sides are too crooked. This is a Cooper's plane. Uh, but it works great for jointing shingles as well. And that's a finished shingle ready to go. Every spring, the sheep were shorn and their fleece was woven into thread, and then the process moved indoors to the loom. This was an extremely complicated piece of machinery for its day, and a time-consuming one also. Um, so this is some wool for some blankets, and it's been woven in a, a twill weave, a twill pattern that has every thread going over two threads and under two threads throughout the whole fabric. And what we do to weave is set up this loom, all the threads for the length of the cloth get wound in this back beam here. They get pulled forward and they get threaded through these harnesses. One, uh, four through two, one, all the way across here for this kind of weave. And then the actual weaving takes place here in the front of the loom. In order to do that, I need to separate groups of threads in order to throw a shuttle carrying a weft thread through that space and create an actual woven cloth. So for this kind of pattern, we have to bring down the first and the second harnesses first, which are attached to trebles that my feet are pushing down. We take a shuttle with the thread inside, wound here, beat that thread in, change the set of threads that are down, so now it goes from one and two to two and three. Bring this forward, we have a new shed here, a new space. That shuttle goes through, throws it in, from two and three it goes to three and four, have that new space opened up, throw the shuttle, beat it in, one and four, there's that last of the four uh, changes that need to happen. This pattern, and then it begins again. So now one and two are back down. We have that new shed. Women are uh, the women in the household are probably making things like blankets, sheets, um, 
material for aprons, um, neckcloths, handkerchiefs, that sort of thing. The cloth that they're using for most of their clothing, the majority of that is being imported. Um, some people estimate that only about 25% of the cloth used and consumed in America in the late 18th century was actually produced here, that most of it was coming from abroad. Living in a port like Bristol, you have access to shipping from all over the world. Uh, our work here begins with what's left behind. That's really all we can look at as historians. We look at documents, uh, written records, probate, uh, inventories, court records, um, diaries, letters, reminiscences, things like that. We look at paintings and engravings and, and uh, visual images that people left behind. It's, it's not a staid exhibit. It's not something that's just unmoving or anything, but to tell the stories. I like, I like to tell the stories. Yeah, we're not going to pull out everything every day as an exhibit. We're, we really are doing these things that we need to do in order of priority and season. And we teach about the season that we're in right now. If you come here in January or, or February, You'll find snow on most of the ground, you'll find us cutting a lot of wood and firewood and um, working on our buildings and repairing them and, and maintaining our tools and doing that kind of work, tending to our livestock. If you come here in the middle of summer, of course, we've got a garden that needs tending and, and weeding and, and planting. We've got uh, work that goes on in the house. And they'll walk in here and say, this is just like my grandmother's kitchen. This is like what it was um, in the Ukraine or in Portugal or in you know, Hungary or some, some place where they've come. And, oh yes, my grandmother did this and we did that and then we always went in the garden when we did that and then we slaughtered a pig, it was like this and you know, it's, that's exciting to me because then I get to learn from them too. In order to ensure that the food for the day would be on time, the first thing the farmer's wife had to do was to get the oven ready. She began by getting a fire started in the fireplace. Once the fire was going, she would remove some of the embers and place them into the oven, along with some kindling and small pieces of wood, to restart a second fire. The oven was a dome-shaped masonry space built entirely of bricks. The fire was then allowed to burn until the entire oven was blackened. And then you'll see sort of the slowing of the flames. They're still in there, it's still really warm, but the flames are sort of in slow motion. It's really neat. And, and at that point, you can see the fire begin to change the interior of the oven from black to white. And um, I, I can see into it right now, and I can see that the, everything is, is white all over. And that's where we want the oven. And that's the point at which then you make sure that what's left of the fire is spread pretty much over the, the course of the floor of it. At this point, the embers were removed and put back into the fireplace and the oven was left to temper and lose its sharpest heat. After a short time, the oven was ready for baking. And the heat really lasts a long time. You can probably fill the oven twice with loaves of bread, and there'll still be adequate heat to cook them through properly. Then when you've brought those out to cool, put in something that's going to take a long slow bake. Um, you know, the famous Boston baked beans. You know, they can be mixed up. Any casserole type dish like that uh, can be all mixed up. You have all your ingredients put together. And then that can go in the oven at the end of the day after everything else is baked. The oven is much cooler. Put those in, put the, close them out in the oven again, and uh, take them out the next morning. In this time period, bread and meat were the main staples of the farmer's diet, and they ate plenty of it. This is a raised bread, so it has a lot of wheat flour has some rye flour, and it has a bit of maize too, good white Rhode Island corn. Most of the wheat products used at this time had to be imported and purchased, so adding native grown corn really helped to stretch the wheat. Which is also really good. <laughs> good. After the bread was kneaded, it was allowed to relax until the oven was ready. So this was all mixed up this morning, put some more water, some more flour, a little salt, but it's a very basic uh, bread that, of the sort that had come out of England with the people who settled in this area. Imagine coming home after a hard day's work and biting into a slice of freshly baked bread covered with a generous amount of thick homemade butter. Who knows, on your next visit to Cogshall, you may time it just right to get your own taste of history. Mowing fields on the farm was a labor-intensive job, and nothing like it is today. It was also a project that had to be done, 
and not for cosmetic reasons. Yeah, when you have domesticated animals, uh, obviously what they, what they eat primarily is grass. And in the wintertime, obviously, there is no grass, so you've got to put up hay. The mowing tool used at this time was called a scythe. It required some skill and a steady hand. Uh, it needs to be quite sharp in order to effectively do anything. And in fact, it helps quite a bit if the grass is damp, because there's a little bit more weight to the grass, so there's more inertia in it. So when you slice at its base, it just falls right down. The farmer usually did this mowing early in the morning while the dew was still on the grass. They would work in rows, each person a few steps behind the other. And once a rhythm was established, the work went rather quickly. The larger the field, the more people were needed to mow it in order to get it finished in a sensible amount of time. The grass was then allowed to dry or get made. When the hay is made is when it's dry enough to take in. If it's too wet and you take it in, you can set your barn on fire. Um, it'll spontaneously combust because as it breaks down, as it composts, it'll, it'll heat up sometimes to that, that amount that it can actually combust. This was hard work, but every farmer knew the sharper the scythe, the easier the cut. When the blade starts to dull a little bit, uh, it, it's just a lot more effort and sometimes you have to make two passes because it's not cutting the first stroke. So really you want to maintain it because if it gets too dull, just like any other sharp tool, it takes longer to sharpen it. So if you do it just every once in a while, it's a quick thing and you just, uh, to wet is no let is a saying that uh, I like a lot. And it's, <laughs> I, I find it's the same with relationships or anything else. <laughs> Maintain it and it's a lot easier. Of course, every farm in the 1790s had a garden that needed to be tended. This chore was relegated to the women of the household, leaving the men to do the harder work. So how well kept the garden was depended on how many women were in the family. The crops normally grown were any crops that could be put up over the winter. They're growing large quantities of beets and onions and carrots and potatoes and turnips and parsnips, uh, beans and peas and, and cabbages and things that they can store. Even though tending the garden wasn't considered hard work, it was still time consuming. Mostly uh, getting rid of the weeds is one big part <laughs> at the same time, but by pulling the, the dirt around the bottom of the plant, it's going to increase that reproduction. Even though having a garden in 1790 was certainly an asset, it wasn't the most important thing. The diet in the 18th century is uh, very heavily focused on meat and grain and bread, and so these sorts of things actually referred to as sauce in the period quite often, and it's sort of an extra thing, which is definitely good to have, and a lot of families do grow gardens, but it's, um, it doesn't have quite the same... Vegetables don't have the same place on the American table in <laughs> the 1790s that they do nowadays. The oxen team was extremely important to farmers in 1790 because they were needed to do all the heavy work. The oxen were put together at a young age as steers before the training began. It took a lot of time and effort to train these animals, which meant working with them on a daily basis. It was also important to keep them well cared for and in good shape in order for them to be able to keep up with the workload. The oxen were taught the commands that they would have to follow. And they do recognize their names as well. So you can say, come up, Duke, and he'll come up. And you can say, step in, Bo, and he'll step in. Once the oxen were fully trained, working with them was relatively easy. The farmer used a stick or goad to direct them. Well, sometimes you can actually get them to do what you want just with the goad in your body position. If you want them to go left, you kind of hold back and keep the stick this way. Or you might get it over there on the other side of them. And they'll, they'll, they'll know that you do that every time we go left, and they'll get the feeling that we're going left. And the same for right, we'll put this in front of his face and we'll say, gee, might not even say gee, and back up. We'll be tapping their legs perhaps a little bit to go back and come up. If they, if they need it, if I really need them to, to, to listen, I'll tap them just a little bit, but I use that very sparingly. Um, they really respect you when you have this, the goad. The oxen are trained to always be on the same side and get confused if they're switched around. The larger or most behaved ox is always kept on the outside. You want the one that's listening to be further away from you um, so that, you know, you don't have a cantankerous animal on the other side uh, doing what he wants and you can't control him.
The oxen team were used for many chores, such as plowing, clearing stones from fields, hauling wood, taking in hay, and any other task that was too much for a man. They were a welcome addition to the 1790s farm. And since we're such a small museum, um, we can do a pretty good job with the details. What we're doing is, is talking about people who were real just like us, who lived and breathed and worked and laughed and cried and played and, and did all these things and, and were real, living, breathing human beings. I think there's a value in, in thinking about our roots, um, thinking about you know, different steps along the way of our, of our human history. And there's a value also of, of a simple, a little bit simpler time. The scenery is gorgeous. And if, you, if that's all you like and you want to come and paint, you can come and do that here. <laughs> you, know, you can just pull your easel and your paints out of the back of your car, set yourself up. Um, if you want a beautiful place to sit with your little ones and have a picnic on an afternoon, bring it and come and sit in the field. You, you can't really come here just once. Um, <laughs> you've got you to come back and, and see how that changes and how that's different and, and what we've learned. Come see us because I think you will come back. I think. Uh, it, this is a very special place with a special fa flavor. Dearest Lord.